This program contains strong course language and graphic content that may disturb some viewers. Around the country, people with disabilities are being detained indefinitely. I see the forensic system as a beast. Do you have any trust in the system? Not at all, no, not at all, nothing, no trust at all. Caged and deemed too dangerous to be released, their needs too complex to treat. They're facing a hopeless future, which I think amounts to a form of torture. Some have committed horrendous acts of violence. He can be dangerous, yes he can be. I'm not gonna gloss over it. This man has some issues. People with an intellectual disability or serious mental illness are being locked away, out of sight. Get me the fuck out of SES, please. In a system that's failing them and their families. It was an attack on a mentally impaired man purely out to destroy him, and it did. That's what happened. We have to balance the risk of the person to themselves and to others. The last thing anybody wants is reoffending. The most violent offender is entitled to be regarded as a human being. In this episode of Four Corners, forensic patients tell their stories for the first time. We'll expose how the system designed to rehabilitate people has made patients sicker and, in some cases, more dangerous. As a uh, take a muscle, my spirit, you're like a piece of steak on a barbecue. It's December 2022. A man known as Adrian steps out of a locked unit into a caged courtyard. This is the first time the public has seen how Adrian lives. As someone who cares for people, it is a confronting thing. You know, if you asked a five-year-old what that is, they would say that is a cage. He's had a terrible life. Quality of life has been non-existent. He's a number in a building, and it's a building that's out of sight. In his mid-30s, Adrian lives with an intellectual disability and a chromosomal disorder. For the past 11 years, he's rarely left the Forensic Disability Service in Brisbane's West. Adrian has never been convicted of a crime. The overwhelming majority of people who are put on forensic orders are put on those orders when the evidence has not been tested in a court of law and they haven't been formally found guilty of the offences. In 2012, Adrian was charged with serious criminal offences and rather than facing trial, he was placed on a forensic order by a specialist mental health court. Now considered to not be fit to be tried and to lack uh, capacity to take criminal responsibility. In Queensland, you can't identify forensic patients or report on their alleged crimes. What we can say is that Adrian was left unsupervised during a community excursion when a serious incident happened. He ended up in the Forensic Disability Service. Well, he's contained, he's secluded, can't get out, can't hurt anybody. He's not a bad person. He doesn't go out of his way to, to do the things he's done. There are an estimated 700 people detained on forensic orders around Australia and roughly a thousand in the community. In Queensland, those with an intellectual disability can be detained here, where Adrian is held. The Forensic Disability Service was initially spruced as a short-term accommodation option for people on um, these forensic orders. So unfortunately, our experience is that it hasn't lived up to that goal. And for people like Adrian, it's become a nightmare. Last Christmas, when this footage was taken, Adrian had little to celebrate. His case shows the difficult balance between community safety and human rights, and what happens when we get it wrong.
well, I hadn't seen anything like this before. Mary Burge's previous job was to protect the rights of people with disabilities. She's the former public advocate in Queensland, an independent government appointed role. Basically, we are warehousing these people and that's, that's a breach of their human rights. We're doing nothing to improve uh, the, the threat that they pose and so they, they're left in a limbo. They're very closed institutions and community has no idea what goes on. I don't think that, that the authorities would be comfortable with the community having a, a real look at what's happening there. The Forensic Disability Service wouldn't let us in to interview Adrian. So for now, the only way for him to tell his story is through this audio recording. Tyson, one, two, three, Tyson. My whole family want me back home. Any crime in SES meant to only be here for only maximum five years. Truthfully, I'd be more happier being in prison. What me really like, get me out of here <laughs> and be gone from SES. Being here, I don't feel like I may be here with my life, be dead here, and we may die here. Get me the fuck out of SES, please. We want to find out more about Adrian's past, to understand why he's been mostly confined to his locked unit for more than a decade we're going to meet a former carer who spent a lot of time with him when he was a young man. Ian McEwen has worked as a government employed support worker and advocate for people with intellectual disabilities. Good to see you, Ian. Hello, what's He's blowing the whistle because of Adrian's treatment at the Forensic Disability Service. Adrian's predicament at the moment is far worse than what a prisoner experiences. I'm compassionate about Adrian. I feel that in my roles, in working with him, nothing's changed. We've tried desperately to get him movement for him. He is still where he was exactly on day one. As a child, Adrian was physically and sexually abused. His childhood was extremely traumatic. On a scale from one to 10, I know that a few of those incidences were tens. There was a number of things that have happened to him as a child that um, have moulded who he is. He doesn't see that those things that happened to him are wrong. His disability was diagnosed in early childhood. He has limited ability to read, write or understand. He gets frustrated. And of course, frustration leads to behaviours where he can't get his point across and he will have a serious outburst. Is it something that he can control? Once he starts the behaviour, no, it goes to full width. He doesn't let up. Can he be dangerous? He can be dangerous. Yes, he can be. I'm, I'm not going to gloss over it. This, this, this man has some issues. But if you know how to speak to him properly and look at triggers, you're able to navigate where your way around this particular gentleman and, and come out the other side. As a teenager, Adrian burnt his house down and was placed in an institution. Ian was one of his carers. He and his team had a different approach to working with Adrian. When we first started working with Adrian, we did a number of activities. We purchased a, a custom bicycle for him and we were able to ride on the bike tracks floating into Brisbane Way. That was without incident, and we did it on a regular basis. We took him fishing and spent a day fishing in the community. He was able to go into the shop and buy fishing gear. The normality was there. He loved walking Mount Flinders. We would take him out to Mount Flinders and he would walk to the very top. Staff couldn't get there, but he did. <laughs> he was proud of that, that he had done something and achieved something he felt an accomplishment. It was, it was good for him, yeah. He says Adrian was calmer after these excursions. Adrian can live a different life. 
but it has to be with people that would support him. If those people are all on the same page, yes, they can achieve outcomes. They started working together again when Adrian was in his late 20s, this time at the FDS. He could see Adrian was deteriorating. So what do you have here, Ian? Well, I've got a number of letters in regards to how he's viewing his containment and seclusion. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them and, and they're quite graphic in the language that he's used. Adrian's letters show the depths of his desperation. How did it make you feel when you received these and read them? It makes me feel quite upset and, and, um, and frustrates you further. He's displaying here the, the final straw. He's got no other options. He draws, that's the only thing he can do. He's now at a point where I've got nothing more to say except for this word, help me, get me out of here. I was aware that there was a person in the Forensic Disability Service who had been there for some time. He seemed childlike and to have simple views, but to be incredibly frustrated by his circumstances and to have a, a, a sense of hopelessness about his situation. The former public advocate in Queensland, Mary Burgess, has big concerns about what's happening inside the Forensic Disability Service. It was a shock to me to think that we were treating people with this level of disability in this way. I began raising concerns about uh, what I considered was a breach of his rights. Solitary confinement is meant to only be for emergency sort of imminent threat kinds of situations. It's become the default regime for this person, which is was never the intention and should never be the intention. And when her complaints to the Queensland government weren't acted on, she went to the state's ombudsman, which delivered a damning report in 2019. The ombudsman found in relation to Adrian that the approach to secluding Adrian had been contrary to law, unreasonable, oppressive and improperly discriminatory. And what does that mean? He was treated unlawfully. Yet he's still there under the same regime. Yes, nothing's changed for this man. Adrian's treatment is still unlawful. The ombudsman has described it as systemic abuse. This man and many of the people held on forensic orders who have disability, they're facing this same future, which is a future uh, holding nothing for them, a hopeless future. And that's cruel. It, I think, amounts to a form of torture. So you think Adrian is essentially being tortured by the state? I wouldn't be suggesting anyone commenced with that intention, but the treatment that he's receiving amounts to that. And um, where are the cameras? Four years after the Queensland Ombudsman's report, another carer says he can't stay silent any longer. In my time working at the FDS, I've spent more time with Adrian than I spent with any member of my family. You have to come to terms yourself. Forensic officer Isaac Wormsley is also blowing the whistle about what he's seen at the Forensic Disability Service. Adrian has communicated to us. He is worried he's going to die there. Is that something that he's said to you? It's, it's something that is present every day that you work with Adrian. It is certainly the fear of, of everyone who supports him. So how do you communicate with, with Adrian? So we communicate through a servery window. There's a wall that separates us and so it looks a bit like that. And you know, I would sit at the end of a table that comes out from the servery and Adrian sits on the other side in his chair. It's sort of about eye level, but that is the only window through which, you know, we communicate. And what is it like having such limited human contact with someone that you're caring for? It's certainly like a, a very alien experience. It doesn't feel natural. Imagine every birthday party that you've ever had. Uh, every Christmas morning you have experienced through a hole in the wall, size of a pizza box. Mm. 
there's no argument to be made for this to be somebody's world for, you know, as long as they live. Queensland's ombudsman reported that Adrian was charged five times with assaulting staff at the FDS. All the charges were dropped due to his intellectual disability. Disturbingly, it also found Adrian now prefers to be in seclusion. It's something Isaac's witnessed too. He wants the door locked because he doesn't want to hurt you. And the fact that he's conditioned, has been institutionalised for that to be his belief, that is a really, really, really confronting and damaging thing to, to believe. Isaac Wormsley is afraid he'll be punished for speaking out and has engaged the Human Rights Law Centre. The Queensland Minister for Disability Services and the Administrator of the FDS both declined to be interviewed. In a statement, the service said its highest priorities were the safety and welfare of the community, its clients and staff. Ultimately, the state's Mental Health Review Tribunal will decide when Adrian is ready to leave the FDS. Forensic patients are also being detained in jails across Australia. This can make people sicker and more dangerous because they're not always getting the proper care they need. Gadigal man Michael Heatley and his sister Christine were exposed to the criminal underworld from a young age. We grew up in a family that had uh, strong connections and ties to organised crime here in Australia. Their father and uncles were some of the most notorious armed robbers on the East Coast. And finally, from Port Sorrel in Tasmania, we have Christine Heatley and her uncle Earl. Where would you find haemoglobins? Earl. In the blood. In the blood is correct. Five points. It's fair to say that we're very, very familiar with most of the visiting rooms in New South Wales prisons. My father was in custody and I was abandoned by my mother when I was five years old, so I was raised by my grandparents in Tasmania with my two sisters and my younger brother. It's just how it was. Yeah, I accepted it and just grew up. I committed armed robberies and I found myself in jail. I didn't have any money. I needed money. The quickest way to get money was to run in and rob a bank. So that's what I chose to do. I robbed the place at gunpoint and um, I left. He terrified and threatened customers and employees of the Commonwealth Bank and stole $18,700. To be threatened with a weapon and told that they were going to be shot if they didn't obey his commands would have been a most terrifying experience. By the age of 23, Michael Heatley had committed two armed robberies and been acquitted of murder. To try and reduce his jail time, he says he initially faked symptoms of schizophrenia. In 1999, he was diagnosed by a psychiatrist in Sydney's Long Bay Prison Hospital. He's been caught in the forensic labyrinth for more than two decades, spending most of that time in jail. Michael's journey in the forensic system and his indefinite detention, the medication regime, it has been catastrophic for Michael's life course. He has gone through just the most horrendous conditions. My brother, like a lot of others, is just in that machine. Stuck. Stuck. Yeah. It's almost impossible for a journalist to interview someone like Michael Heatley. It's taken months to gain this unprecedented access to the Sydney Forensic Hospital, where he's now detained. We're going to go in and speak to Michael Heatley. It's the first time that any patient here has ever done a media interview and told their story. Hello, 
Michael. Hello, Alice, how are you? Good. Nice Lynn, to meet you. Nice to meet Thank you. you for meeting me okay. and sharing your story. Okay. How has your experience in prison as a forensic patient affected how you see the forensic system? I see the forensic system as a beast that chews you up and spits you out. That's how, that's how I see the forensic system. That's how I describe it. That's been my experience. Before he was admitted here in 2019, Michael Heatley says one of his worst experiences was the three months he spent in what's known as a dry cell in neighbouring Long Bay Jail. The dry cell was like a 10 square metre cell. It had two cameras. There was no water, there was no toilet. It had a mattress. And to urinate, I had to urinate in bottles. There were days, it was during summer, there were days that there was up to half a dozen urine bottles in this cell. And I would continually get headaches. They refused to give me Panadol. And like I was in there virtually like at least 23 hours a day, every day. You also received forced injections in prison. Can you describe how they do that and the impact it has on you? And what they do is they come down and they, they, approach, they approach your cell and they'll say to you, we're here to assist with forced medication. Are you going to comply? If, if you say no, they get their shoes, they put on their helmets, they put in their padding, they open the door, they run on you, know, they use whatever force is appropriate to hold you down and then the nurse sticks it in your, your backside and yeah, you, you're medicated. And why did you not want the medication? Because the medication is awful, it's horrible, it's like a torture. You're in a constant state of agitation and restlessness. Michael basically had to be carried and he wasn't in good shape at all. Michael's sister, Christine, remembers visiting her brother after he received one of these injections. He had saliva coming out of his mouth, his eyes were rolling, and it was a very short visit because Michael could not stay in that room. It was a form of chemical restraint. And that to me is, it's shocking. For Michael, there was worse to come. As a forensic patient, he spent two years in one of Australia's toughest prisons, Goulburn Supermax. It was like being on another planet. The only people you really see are, are the screws. They, they come to your door three times a day to feed you. There's a lot of lockdowns. You, you spend 24 hours in your cell. And is that environment, the Supermax environment, the segregation prison environment, is that conducive to getting better? No, it was, it was, it was horrible, it was awful. It wasn't good at all. It was, it was good in no way at all. These years in jail came after a major incident in 2004. At that time, he was being treated with a particular antipsychotic medication in the Long Bay Prison Hospital. It started giving me suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation. I told the treating psychiatrist what it was doing to me. He laughed in my face and said, it can't do that, it's an antipsychotic. Eventually, the medication was ceased and the suicidal ideation and the homicidal ideation got worse. As Michael Heatley waited for a mental health bed in the Long Bay Prison Hospital, guards were discussing whether he should share a cell with another inmate. The events that followed show how catastrophic the outcome can be when a dangerously unwell forensic patient is mismanaged. I voiced my concerns to the psychologist. This is what's going on with my mind and this is why I'm speaking to you. She prepared a report and gave it to Corrective Services outlining the fact that she believed me to be a true risk to other patients and staff. The psychologist told prison officials to keep Michael Heatley alone in his cell. Michael says he warned the guards that he might kill someone. And I told them when they were putting him into my cell, listen, I'm homicidal, I shouldn't be with anybody. They told me I was full of shit. On the day of the incident, Corrective Services officers decided to take a young person and put him in the cell with Heatley. And within hours, Heatley had kicked him to death. How catastrophic was that decision by the prison guards to put that man in your cell? It cost him his life. And what impact did that have on you as well, that decision? It ruined my life. As uh, taking my soul, my spirit. I, I lost my, I lost my fiance. I'm separated from my son. Like I said, it, it, like I didn't get any favors from it. 
Michael Heatley said he was unable to control his homicidal urges after coming off medication in the lead up to killing the inmate. What are your views of this from a, a clinical perspective? One would think that if he was on medication, he may have had better control of his urges. Maybe if he'd had an opportunity to be assessed in a hospital environment, the outcome may have, may have been quite different, yeah. Due to his mental illness, Michael Heatley was convicted of manslaughter rather than murder and remained as a forensic patient. Anthony Wheely was the Supreme Court judge who sentenced Michael. This is the part of the sentencing decision that I gave and it says, were, however, this offender simply to disappear into the grim moor of the hospital psychiatric prison system with little hope of rescue, with little hope of proper treatment and reform, simply because he is a difficult person, this would be a very sad condemnation of our prison system. Dr Rosalie Wilcox was the psychiatrist who first diagnosed Michael in Long Bay in 1999. I felt that he definitely had some form of mental illness. He's experienced quite horrific behaviour, punitive behaviour, and so that's going to influence his ability to be reintegrated into society. Do you think that prison is an appropriate environment for a forensic patient? No, it's definitely not a, a, an appropriate environment. and. That's very much driven by resources. We have a, a lack of beds and as a consequence, people are in jail who shouldn't be in jail. New South Wales Corrective Services told us it's increased the number of mental health beds in the state's prisons. After the death of his cellmate, Michael Heatley spent the next 15 years in prison. In 2019, he was finally transferred to the Sydney Forensic Hospital, where he remains detained indefinitely. You've committed violent crimes in the past. Do you have any insight now into why you did those things? Not really. If you are released, is there any reason why people should feel like you're a risk to not the community? Not at all, not at all, no, not at all, not at all. I'm a, I'm a changed person. You had uncontrollable homicidal urges in the past. Do you think that that could happen again? Not at all, not at all. I believe it was the medication. How does it feel not knowing when you're going to get out? It's, it's, been, it's been over 21 years now. Every day is virtually the same. You wake up, you, know, you, you, you eat some food, you do some exercise, you go to sleep. It's just another day of your life gone down the drain. Michael Heatley's sister, Christine, believes her brother has spent too long in custody. She's been his fierce advocate for decades. And the psychiatrist just blew it off and said that it was a staffing issue and they can't do anything about that. He's now served his full sentence for the manslaughter of his cellmate. Thanks, dear. Thanks for your advice. Bye, Patrick. Bye. What's happening today is the Mental Health Review Tribunal, so they've pushed it back an hour. In New South Wales, the Mental Health Review Tribunal decides when forensic patients are ready to re-enter the community. Michael Heatley has to appear every six months. After more than 40 tribunal hearings, Christine is pushing for him to have short, supervised trips outside the forensic hospital. Hopefully they're not going to be so arrogant that they're still just going to say blatantly Therapeutic leave can't be on the table. Therapeutic leave would not be... We can't record the hearing, but it clearly hasn't gone well for the Heatleys. What's wrong with these fucking cunts? These are university graduated fucking people. Mm. His supervised leave wasn't approved. It was absolutely alarming to me to hear that the treating team thought that my brother having therapeutic leave would not have any good effect on him. So I found that bizarre. Oh, it's outrageous. It makes no sense. No one could give an indication as to how much more time I'll spend in this place. Yeah, it's like um, in every six months between tribunals, it's just another six months, one year, two years, that like are just being thrown away from your life. Exactly, that's right. Do you have any trust in the doctors here in the system? Not at all. No, not at all. Nothing. No trust at all. 
And why is that? Because of what's happened to me in the past and what's currently happened to me. For somebody to have no trust in the system um, is, is definitely challenging, um, but it's something that we've got to deal with every day. Um, Wendy Hoey is the chief executive of Justice Health. It provides the majority of health services, including forensic mental health, in the New South Wales justice system. And we've been working really hard over the last two to three years to reduce the number of forensic patients that are in our prisons um, quite successfully. I don't think forensic patients should be in the prison system. I think they should be in a health environment and we're doing our very best to change that. I think it's also really important to remember that the majority of forensic patients are actually living in the community. They're not in any of those forensic high secure hospitals or medium secure hospitals, low secure, but they're leading safe and productive lives within the community. Does that indefinite nature of detention, is it sometimes counterproductive to what you're trying to do here? It can be. So if you put, if you put the reason that people are there in the first place, which is generally a um, long and enduring mental health issues such as schizophrenia, where you do have a lack of insight, they've often faced a lot of trauma in their, in their background and whether it be in the community or whether it be coming through prison. Um, so th the outcome for us to manage is, is quite a complex issue and um, I think it is difficult but you can't put a time frame on it that wouldn't be fair either. But is it not punitive and arbitrary to be holding someone indefinitely? Well I don't think we do hold anybody indefinitely I think people can progress through the forensic They don't have a release date? System. No they don't have a release date. Nobody's saying it's easy but we have to work in the best interest of the patient and the best interest of the community. I mean, the last thing anybody wants is reoffending, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Michael Heatley is facing another possible obstacle to his release. He's been looked at in a New South Wales commission of inquiry into gay hate crimes. A murder that Michael Heatley was acquitted of in the mid-90s is being re-examined by the Special Commission of Inquiry into LGBTQI hate crimes. Do you think that this should change our perception of Michael Heatley and his ability to potentially re-enter the community? No, I don't think it's relevant to uh, the question of his mental state now or his level of dangerousness towards himself or the community. That would be evaluated according to his state of mind and state of being now. It would not be impacted by something that he may or may not have done in the mid-90s. And the most violent offender is entitled to be regarded as a human being. It's human nature to deplore them, to criticise them, uh, to be afraid of them, but nevertheless, they are human beings and we have to treat them as such and hope for their rehabilitation and return to society. Australia's indefinite detention of people with a disability has been condemned on the international stage. All the way from Brisbane to the United Nations, New York. A group of Australian lawyers and advocates is at the United Nations calling for change. They couldn't be a more important... Lawyer Matilda Alexander represents Queensland forensic patients, including Adrian. They can't tell their story. She's fighting for an end to their indefinite detention. The UN tried to come to Queensland to see the mental health ward, to see the Forensic Disability Services in October 2022. And they weren't allowed in, so we'll take the stories from those places and present them today. There are only two countries in the world that the United Nations has cancelled. Yeah, two. Us and Rwanda. Us and Rwanda. Yeah. We are concerned that persons with psychosocial disabilities continue to be subject to widespread and multiple forms of discrimination. We remain concerned about insufficient protections against torture, abuse and neglect of institutionalised people with disability. We cannot remain silent on the indefinite detention of people with disabilities. Institutionalisation is a discriminatory act of violence. 
I don't know whether the government will listen to our call. I don't know whether the government will really understand the importance of ending indefinite detention immediately for people with disability. Um, I hope that they will hear, I hope that they will listen and I hope that they will change. Back home, pressure is building too. The Disability Royal Commission made recommendations to end indefinite detention and make prison a place of last resort for forensic patients. For these people, getting out of prison doesn't necessarily solve their problems. Too often, the damage is already done and moving back into the community can be difficult. So Mike, how's Chris going today? Uh, unfortunately, he's not good today. No, he's been to the hospital, but he didn't wait. And apparently, according to the support worker, he ran off. So we're just going to go down there and check on him and make sure he's OK. And what did the support worker say about what happened today? Uh, well, they're not sure whether it was a psychotic episode or not. But um, he has been shouting. OK which is not a good sign. Mike Porch's son, Chris, was released from prison last year. He has an intellectual disability, a history of substance abuse, and has been charged with dozens of offences over three decades. Our life has been uh, police, courts, prison. Yeah, that'll be the next step. It's All up, Chris has spent more than 20 years of his life in prison. He now lives in the Perth suburbs on an NDIS package. Mike believes there still isn't enough support to help Chris transition into the community. It takes you over, consumes you. Yeah, not, not a nice way to live. Right, he lives just down here now. say hello, yeah. you know, and hey. all that. We just wondered how you're going today. Yeah, not bad. Just wanted to have a chat to you if it's OK, Chris, about some of the things that you've been through. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. As young parents, we never dreamed that we would have a mentally impaired child. This happens to someone else, you know, someone else's family, not ours. Chris was born with the umbilical cord around his neck. We found out that this uh, damaged the frontal lobes. As he grew, he got older. It was quite evident then. He's impulsive, poor memory, poor decision making, easily led. Lots and lots of things like this. He got to the age of about 13 in that photograph there. And that's when the nightmare started. When did he start to kind of get in trouble with... Yes, um, well, basically from the age of about 14, 15, it was different things, petty theft. As the years went by, he got deeper into the drugs, the crime escalated, and then I think he got to about 18, and that was the first time then he was incarcerated. How would you sum up Chris's experience in the criminal justice system? He's been destroyed, really. I don't know how he coped, to be truthful. But Chris is a survivor. He's 50 years old. I'm amazed he's still alive. In 2017, he was charged with dozens of offences, including threats to kill and theft. After two years in custody, Chris Porch was placed on the West Australian equivalent of a forensic order. He ended up here at Perth's Disability Justice Centre. It's meant to provide state-of-the-art care for 10 patients with an intellectual disability, but has never housed more than three people. The decision was made to place Chris into the Disability Justice Centre. We thought at last now that Chris would receive the treatments that he needed. Geez, were we wrong. It was clear to his parents that Chris wasn't being properly supervised. 
He stopped taking his antipsychotic medication and became increasingly distressed. He just cracked, simple as that. He broke through the glass doors into the foyer entry with a fire extinguisher. He sat down on the floor. Chris waited for the police to arrive. They arrested him. Despite two psychiatrists saying Chris should return to the Disability Justice Centre, the former WA Disability Services Minister, Stephen Dawson, refused to approve the request. This left the board that oversees forensic patients with little option but to send Chris back to prison. Was Chris particularly vulnerable in prison? Oh, he's very vulnerable in prison. Um, that's one of the problems with people with mental health problems and cognitive impairment is that they're a high risk of being victimised um, from other prisoners in their prison environment. Psychiatrist Adam Brett assessed Chris in Acacia Prison. Chris spent time in isolation and was tormented by other prisoners. When you saw him in prison, how was he? He was clearly struggling. Uh, he had a poor understanding of why he was in prison. He blamed others for his situation. Does the Western Australian government have a responsibility to protect people with a disability from things that happen, like what happened to Chris? I think they do. There are things afoot to try and address the problems in West Australia, which is good, so we're moving forward at the moment. Um, but I suppose that hasn't helped Chris. Where does Chris belong? Well, I think Chris belongs in the community. The WA Justice Department says prisoners with a cognitive disability are usually held in a separate unit in Acacia Prison. A state government spokeswoman said if a resident at the DJC threatens violence or damages property, then prison could be a better option for them. New laws will come into effect next year to end indefinite detention in WA, and the minister will no longer have the power to refuse patients access to the DJC. Mike Porch feels the burden on families like his is too great and more support is desperately needed. You can't walk away from this unscathed. It would break a lot of marriages, you know, having a child like this. It takes its toll, but broken, nearly, but not quite. They won't break me, that's for sure. We're doing a story about the experiences of, of people in the prison system and yeah. in the disability justice oh. centre. Yeah. Would it be okay for me to ask you some questions about that? Oh, I'll let's hold a minute and then that's it. What, what was it like in the Disability Justice Centre for you? Oh, it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. Uh, what was not nice about it, Chris? Oh, I didn't like it. They stopped your tobacco, didn't they? Uh, was it yeah. hard being in there? Oh, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. And after you're in... <laughs> He's had enough. Uh, yeah. all right, all right, that thank okay? you. Thank, thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks, okay. Brother. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, mate. I'll see you I might look in tomorrow, see how you go in. Mike's relieved that his son is OK for now. Today, he meets two of Chris's neighbours for the first time. As long as he's not causing you any trouble and he's... Uh... He always comes past when he walks past, he says hello, so he's gorgeous. He's right. lovely. Yeah. And right. often says hi and we Good. chat. How often do you see him? Oh, probably oh. once. I probably see him every day. Yeah. Almost, yeah. yeah. He seems lonely sometimes. Oh, well, he is. Bad. He's very lonely. That's, that's another problem. Yeah. And, I don't know, people can be scared of approaching him they or do. something. They but can. I'm not yeah. worried. No, I'm, I think he probably needs a hug. Great. Like, that's fantastic. How yeah. often is he getting a hug? <laughs> he had a hug with you, that was nice. Well, I always do when I see yeah. him. Balancing community safety and the human rights of forensic patients is a real dilemma. Those trapped in the system have been kept out of sight for so long. Now they're finally being heard. <laughs> Thank you.
what kind of life do you want outside of here, outside of the hospital? I want to return and have a life. I'd like to go to work, pay my taxes, live an honest and peaceful life. What we really want, I want to be out on the night ocean near the beach, maybe go like ah, walking on the beach. I love to be in there.